Good morning. This is Dr. Shobhya Chatterjee, and today we will discuss about Richard Steele's The Spectator Club, which is included in the series of periodical essays named The Spectator. So, first of all, it is important for us to know what is a periodical essay. A periodical essay, uh, it was a new literary form that emerged during the early part of the 18th century. And uh, it was published, it was regularly published, it came out regularly, twice or thrice a week. And it was usually one or two pages long. It was composed on a single subject or uh, it was based on a single specific theme. Uh, and uh, for the most part, uh, the readers of the periodical essays uh, were educated middle class uh, individuals who held learning in high esteem, but they were not intellectuals. And uh, women, they were also the growing part of the, of the audience of periodical essays and uh, the editors of the periodical essays, uh, they always tried to satisfy the uh, taste of this uh, new category of audience in their publication. So uh, today uh, we will know about the reasons uh, which, uh, you know, uh, which made periodical essays uh, so popular among uh, the masses. Now what were the reasons uh, for the popularity of the periodical essays? Uh, the periodical essays uh, found a spectacular response in the 18th century on account of various reasons. Uh, fundamentally, this new genre was in perfect harmony with the spirit of the age. Uh, it sensitively combined the tastes of the different classes of readers with the result that it appealed to the resurgent middle classes. So this was one of the reasons uh, why uh, the uh, periodical essays were so popular. Uh, again, in the 18th century, there was a phenomenal spark in literacy. And for this phenomenal spark in literacy, uh, the circle of readers, it expanded. And uh, so, uh, they welcomed the periodical essays as it was a light kind of literature. It was not a heavy kind of literature. It was very uh, light in its mood. Uh, the brevity of the periodical essay, uh, its common sense approach and its tendency to dilute morality and philosophy for popular consumption paid rich dividends. Uh, and uh, for this reason, it became very popular uh, during the 18th century. Uh, to a great extent, uh, the periodical essayist assumed uh, the office of the clergyman and uh, taught the masses the lesson of elegance and refinement, uh, though not of morality of the some singing kind. So the periodical paper was particularly welcome as uh, it was not a dry affair uh, like the professional sermon, in spite of being highly instructive in nature. Uh, so in most cases, the periodical essayist communicated with the reader uh, with a kind of familiarity and uh, another reason for its popularity was the avoidance of politics uh, though not by all the political essayists yet um, by a good many of them they avoided uh, political issues greatly again the periodical essayists uh, made it a point to cater to the uh, for the female test and give due consideration to the female point of view. Uh, so, uh, in that way, uh, they won uh, for them many female readers too. And all these factors were responsible uh, for the universal acceptance of the periodical essay uh, in the 18th century England. So, first of all, let us know about uh, the author that is Richard Steele. Richard Steele, he was uh, born in Dublin in March 6, 1672. He was uh, the son of an attorney. Now, his parents, uh, they died when he was very young. 
and so he was brought up by an uncle the name of that uncle was henry gascoigne henry gascoigne uh, his uncle uh, he was secretary to the first duke of ormond and uh, this duke of ormond he sent uh, richard steel to charter house that was a very uh, famous institution and it was in this charter house uh, it was um, uh, there where he first met addition that is joseph addition and uh, in 1690 richard steel he went up to oxford then in uh, 1694 uh, he suddenly enlisted in the horse guards in 1695 he published a poem uh, the poem uh, it was based on uh, the funeral of queen mary it was dedicated to lord cards uh, lord cards uh, it was the person who made him his secretary and ensigned him uh, in the coldstream guards so uh, we find that uh, by 700 and 705 he was a captain in lord lucas's regiment of foot and then he engaged in researches for the philosopher's stone he married in the same year he married a widow the name of that widow was uh, margaret stretch margaret stretch uh, she had uh, estates in barbados and then in 1706 richard steel he was made gentleman in wit- in waiting uh, to queen anne's concert and in uh, may 1707 he was appointed uh, to the post of gazetteer then uh, his first wife he died in 1707 may 1707 and then he married again uh, he married uh, miss mary scarlock in september so uh, when uh, if you look at uh, the issues related to periodical essays then uh, we will find that uh, in uh, on uh, 12th april 1709 uh, the first issue of tri weekly tatler appeared and uh, this continued until january 1711 in 1710 uh, steel he became commissioner for stamps the tatler uh, it was succeeded in march 1711 by uh, the spectator which was even more famous uh, than the tat- uh, than the tatler and uh, uh, the spectator uh, it ceased its publication in december 1712 and then it was followed uh, in march 1713 by the guardian still uh, he entered the parliament for uh, stroke bridge and then uh, the guardian uh, it was dropped for the more professedly political uh, the englishman in 1714 still uh, he was expelled from the house uh, for his seditious utterances in the crisis uh, but uh, after the death of queen anne uh, his party it again came into power and uh, richard steel he was reelected to parliament and then he was knighted he uh, was made a patentee of the drury lane theater uh, the drury lane theater it was where uh, in 1722 he produced 
द कंसस लवर्स द कंसस लवर्स इट कैन बी रिगार्डेड एज स्टील्स बेस्ट कॉमेडी स्टील डायड इन फर्स्ट फर्स्ट सेप्टेम्बर सेवेंटीन हंड्रेड एंड ट्वेंटी नाइन एट So um, uh, Richard Steele, he was one of the most important and uh, most controversial figures of early 18th century sociability. Uh, perhaps he was uh, best known for his contributions to periodical literature and his fame his fame is related uh, to uh, he was so well known because of his style and content of his writing his style uh, it had a long legacy during the 18th century the successful formula uh, was Uh, to offer cultural comment this cultural comment uh, of uh, richard still it included uh, theater criticism it included poetry it included uh, gallantry uh, and uh, sometimes it was also mixed uh, with moral guidance uh, and it was uh, this uh, cultural comments uh, was were always uh, presented in a periodical essay format uh, it came with uh, some politics uh, some news and it was also lightened with humor so uh, still uh, he was nevertheless uh, a highly partisan polemicist and he had uh, relatively circumscribed Uh, view uh, of whom constituted the people now talking about uh, joseph addison and richard still uh, joseph addison and richard still uh, they both lived rich lives on their own uh, but uh, here uh, we will briefly talk about them as um, we'll talk about them together Uh, because uh, of their collaborative uh, journalism uh, which um, for which uh, they are best remembered the essay series the tatler uh, which was uh, produced during the time 1709 uh, to 1711 and then the spectator which was produced during the time 1711 to 1712 and uh, uh, joseph addison and richard still they are uh, best remember uh, remembered for uh, these series of essays so uh, uh, these uh, two authors they are uh, they were born uh, just a few weeks apart and they knew each other uh, from the age of 13 they also overlapped at oxford though they attended different colleges uh, we know that addition went to queens and magdalen and still he went to christ college uh, sorry christ church and martin uh, but their paths crossed again in london in the early part of the 18th century and both of them they had uh, political and literary ambitions by all accounts we can regard that uh, addition and still uh, they had very different personalities addition had many friends and uh, uh, he seems to have been brilliant at getting people uh, influential to support and help him but uh, addition's personal demeanor uh, was serious he wrote ambitious poems he wrote uh, the century's most significant verse tragedy that was cato published in 1713 and uh, it was a play cato was a play that is rarely staged 
but now uh, uh, it was a staple of the repertory for decades and on the other hand still he was more a journalist at heart his plays are all comedies to be sure addition wrote a comedy too but it was not very successful whereas whereas uh, still he had several hits and a lot of people seem to be unable to take still very seriously still was notorious for running up big debts and uh, also he was often mocked in the public press of the period so these two men they are very different uh, and the way that they were received by others uh, it had to do with issues of class and ethnicity still was irish still was also from a respectable family in dublin his father was an attorney as i told you but uh, he did not have much of a family network in england uh, to help him and uh, to make his way in this world he almost certainly faced his share of prejudice against irish people uh, that many english people harbored for centuries after this time at oxford uh, which he left without completing a degree still went into the army and uh, he did well rising to become a captain as a side project uh, while he was still in the military at some point uh, his military career stalled and then he came to london to work in the government he got a position at court and he took on uh, the job of editing the official newspaper the london gazette addition was uh, not from a particularly wealthy or noble family either but uh, the additions were placed well placed uh, in the power structure of the church of england the official state church addition's father lancelot uh, he was the chaplain of the english garrison at tangier in morocco and uh, uh, he would later become the dean of the cathedral at lichfield one of addition's brothers uh, he became uh, the english governor of madras in india so joseph addition seems to have been identified early on as someone uh, who would have a significant public career uh, after finishing his degree at oxford joseph addison was sent on a grand tour of the continent at government expense and uh, he would go on to be a member of the parliament uh, he was essentially given a seat there uh, he did not have to campaign and uh, he was a cabinet minister so um, still uh, after he left uh, london uh, and uh, he started the tatler uh, in uh, 1709 and this journal uh, which was published three times a week it was Uh, this tatler it was something new and uh, something it was uh, it had something very innovative in it uh, because rather than uh, focusing on the news it offered essays on a variety of topics uh, such as theater reviews uh, essays on clothing essays on manners and so on it was fast paced it was also very entertaining and in an age 
when much print publication was bitterly political and uh, non-partition, their tattler it became immediate popular. Immediately popular it became. And still he asked Addison and other friends uh, to join him uh, because uh, it was surely hard to come up with enough material on his own. And addition, he contributed several dozen essays. Uh, the Tatler folded at the start of 1711, but almost immediately it was followed by The Spectator, uh, which was another series of pe uh, periodical essays. Uh, in case of The Spectator, addition, he himself took the lead. He contributed uh, a larger number of essays than Steele and most scholars agree uh, setting the tone uh, for the new journal uh, it was addition uh, who contributed greater. Uh, the Spectator uh, which was published every day uh, except uh, Sunday it ran 555 issues until finally running out of steam. Uh, both the journals uh, were widely read in their first publication and perhaps even more so over the course of the next two centuries when they were collected together and they were bound up as book length volumes. A set of the tattlers and the spectators was something uh, that every middle class household uh, with aspirations to looking like its members uh, took literature uh, seriously uh, and these essays they were published uh, in that kind of format scores of time uh, in the English speaking world. Their essays often uh, being offered uh, to students as examples of clear, uh, vigorous English prose. They were also uh, translated into most of the European languages. Uh, these essays have become newly relevant as having inaugurated what the socialist jargon Habermas dubbed the bourgeois public sphere a domain of society uh, separate from the state or the royal courts where middle class people came together and they debate uh, social issues. Even more recently, these short comparatively informal essays, uh, they were published frequently uh, and they have been compared to blogging. Whatever the case, uh, the early 18th century journalism of uh, Joseph Addison and Richard Steele, they remained as an entertaining look into the attitudes, the tastes and the styles of their period. Now, let us come uh, directly to the essay, The Spectator Club. So, as we all know now that The Spectator uh, it was arguably one of the most important periodicals that was ever published. And it had, uh, The Spectator, it had a two series run from March the 1st, 1711 through December 6th, uh, 1712 for a total of 635 issues. And uh, it was edited by two masters of the essay that is uh, they are Richard Steele and Joseph Edison. So for the most part Richard Steele he wrote the first series of 555 issues and Joseph Edison uh, he wrote the second series of 79 issues. Now these essays they resembled most 18th century London newspapers in size and layout. The editorship, uh, it was anonymous, but most uh, readers, many readers, they believed that the writer was Richard Steele uh, because 
he had been just uh, he had been just involved with another periodical uh, which wa which was all, uh, also very well known that was the tatler so richard steel and uh, joseph addition they comprised the two main uh, editors but several issues were written by others also all of whom uh, were associated with the coffee house culture of the 18th century london literati the spectator club this particular essay is perhaps richard steel's finest achievement this essay was published uh, in the spectator uh, in this essay richard steel he had given an account Uh, of the various members of the club the spectator was narrated uh, by uh, the fictional persona the name of that fictional persona is mr spectator and uh, it was with uh, the help of some six members that uh, the spec uh, the spectator club this club was run uh, now these members the six members uh, they represent important sections of the society still uh, he described six of the members of the club and uh, who were the six members they are uh, sir roger de coverley the first member then captain sentry then we have sir andrew freeport uh, then will hanicum and uh, then we have the clergyman and the student of law the essay the spectator club uh, is the second essay in the periodical the spectator still conceived uh, the club uh, with members drawn from different stages of life uh, different uh, strata's of uh, the society and profession and each of them they um, had their own individual qualities thus uh, we can regard the club as uh, the miniature version of the society of the day but uh, it is very important it should be noted that uh, there were uh, no representative from the lower classes Uh, so um, we can uh, think that the club uh, was meant to be of intellectuals and in this essay uh, still uh, gives an account of uh, these six intellectual kind of uh, gentlemen they were members uh, of the spectator club uh, in addition to mr spectator and this essay reveals steel's keen power of observation uh, uh, steel's skill in characterization uh, steel's uh, delicate mockery uh, and also his easy and uh, his informal style uh, so uh, richard steel uh, he introduces uh, to the readers uh the various members of the spectator club in his essay the spectator club and still he wanted to make the readers familiar with his characters his characters uh, they are chiefly the representatives of different sections of the society but still they hold uh, their unique individuality each character uh, they uh, had uh, its uh, unique personality which is described by the writer in his inimitable style the spectator club uh, does um, we may say that presents many interesting characters with contrasting qualities but they are part and parcel of the same society they live uh, and they enjoy together and uh, richard steels the spectator uh, it is a uh, we can consider that it is a, it is a strange combination of the wit the humor the irony and the wisdom 
uh, of all the six characters and they together constitute uh, this spectator club now there is an inscription uh, at the beginning of the essay and this inscription it is uh, taken from uh, satires by juvenal we know that uh, the satires uh, they are a collection of satirical poems by the latin author juvenal and uh, those were written between the end of the first and the early second centuries and uh, they were uh, comprised of a wide ranging discussion of society and social modes in dactylic hexameter and um, these poems uh, uh, they were uh, written by juvenal and he is credited with 16 known poems which were divided among five books all are in the roman genre of satire and this inscription which is included in the text uh, it is taken from the seventh book and uh, is uh, the 166th line which means uh, six more at least join their consenting voice so here uh, it is related uh, to the six people the six members of uh, the spectator club who are joining with uh, the narrator uh, at the same time in the club and all are uh, constituting this club so the first member of the society uh, of uh, this club the spectator club is the good natured sir roger d coverley so steel talks about the first gentleman gentleman of his company uh, and the name of that person is sir roger d coverley sir roger d coverley is a gentleman of an ancient family as uh, still writes uh, if we look into the text we will find that he has written uh, quote unquote his great grandfather was inventor of that famous country dance which is called after him all who know that shire are very well acquainted with the parts and merits of sir roger he is a gentleman that is very singular in his behavior and uh, but his singularities proceed from his good sense and are contradictions to the manners of the world only as he thinks the world is in the wrong so sir uh, roger de coverley he is a gentleman uh, who uh, was uh, a person from a very ancient well known family and he is a person who uh, has so many merits and his behavior his behavior is full of good sense uh, and uh, he is so popular among his fellows uh, when he is in town he lives in soho square uh, the people uh, who knew about the county of sir roger uh, they all know sir roger and uh, he was a man uh, we can regard him as a man of uh, extraordinary nature and he had a good sense uh, his great grandfather uh, as it is there in the text he was uh, the inventor of the coverly dance and uh, his eccentricities the eccentricities of roger de coverly uh, it proceed from his good sense uh, he is free from the bondage of custom and fashion uh, he uh, always found fault uh, with the ways of the world uh, but this unusual nature never made him any enemies 
sir roger uh, he had a unique capacity to please others uh, he uh, was a bachelor why he was a bachelor he was a bachelor uh, because he was disappointed in the love of a beautiful widow once uh, he fell in love with a beautiful widow uh, but that widow she was a perverse uh, she was a wicked kind of lady uh, he uh, uh, had uh, found that a widow uh, she lived uh, next to the country of sir roger did uh, roger de coverly and uh, she rejected his love uh, and after this rejection there was a disappointment uh, which made uh, sir roger de coverly so serious uh, he became so serious very serious for a year and a half but uh, gradually he got over that seriousness that uh, that disappointment and then uh, he preferred to keep himself a bachelor but before this uh, disappointment uh, he was uh, a normal happy young man he moved in uh, the society of important persons like uh, lord rochester uh, like sir uh, george etheridge however after being ill used by the widow he lost all his joviality uh, all his interest in social life for more than a year and he became very serious gradually his uh, joviality returned however he grew careless about his dressing sense he wore a coat uh and a jacket of a cut which was in uh, fashion at that time but uh, he had uh, not any kind of particular interest in the uh, dressing in the sense of uh, dressing in the ways of dressing so um, uh, uh, now roger de coverly uh, he is 56 years old but he was um, quite hail and hearty as uh, it is written in the text as it is written by richard steel let us look into the text within quotes he is now in his 56th year cheerful gay and hearty he keeps a good house both in town and country a great lover of mankind but there is such a mirthful cast in his behavior that he is rather beloved than esteemed his tenants grow rich his servants look satisfied all the young women profess love to him and the young men are glad of his company quotation close so we find that uh, roger de coverly Uh, he had a house in village and also another house in the town he had a, a good nature such a good nature that people loved him he also treated his servants well he was also the justice of the quorum and uh, he followed his judicial abilities on uh, the hair of the justice at the quarter session sometimes ago sometime ago he won universal applause by explaining a passage in the game act so this is the description of roger de coverly that we find in uh, the essay the spectator club as given by richard steel after this uh, steel he has described another companion of the club uh this member this companion he is a shrewd critic of drama uh this member is the member of the inner temple and uh he can be referred to as the templar so the next important person is the templar the templar is another bachelor he is a member of the inner temple he is an honest and uh, wise man 
he is a lawyer he was a man of sharp wit and clear understanding he chose his occupation rather to obey the direction of his father his old father than uh, to incline to his own tendencies and uh, he took to the study of law uh, because uh, he was very obedient to his father uh, and uh, originally he was interested in the study of drama and dramatic criticism so the philosophers like aristotle and longinus were well understood by him now his father he used to send him various questions on law in order to ensure his son's progress in legal studies now the son uh, he outwitted the father by getting them answered through a lawyer whom he had engaged with the purpose nobody took him as a fool but only his friends knew that he had a great wit now let us have a look into the text uh, what richer steel has written about him within quotes the gentleman next in esteem and authority among us is another bachelor who is a member of the inner temple a great a man of great probity wit and understanding but he ch- he has chosen his place of residence rather to obey the direction of an old humorsome father than in pursuit of his own inclinations he was placed there to study the laws of the land and is the most learned of any of the house in those of the stage aristotle and longinus are much better understood by him than littleton or cook the father sends up every post questions relating to marriage articles leases and tenures in the neighborhood all which questions he agrees with an attorney to answer and take care of in the lump he is studying the passions themselves when he should be inquiring into the debates among men which arise from them he knows the argument of each of the orations of demosthenes and tully but not one case in the reports of our own courts quotation close so this was the nature of uh, the gentleman the templar uh, he uh, was originally interested in drama in studying uh, the various aspects of drama but it was his father uh, who wanted him to join uh, legal studies and for his father uh, he has um, agreed to study law but uh, originally uh, he loves to uh, read Uh, various portions of aristotle and longinus and he had better understanding of uh, these uh, dramatic criticism so uh, this uh, templar uh, he uh, was a person uh, who uh, loves uh, to read uh, philosophy uh, to read drama uh, he had a great love uh for a uh, literature but uh, he was never really interested in uh, legal studies so as we find in the text that nobody took him as a fool but only his friends knew that he had a great wit he liked to read the books which were not of the age he lived he was familiar with the writings uh, with the customs with the actions and manners of ancient writers and uh, these studies made him a keen observer of the worldly affairs he was a good critic uh, his real hour of business was the time of the play the presence of 
uh, an able critic among the audience would rouse the actors to give the best performance possible and uh, his presence also encouraged various uh, performers he took to the study of law to obey his father his old father uh, but it was always against his willingness and his favorite subject of study was always the arts and the stage so he was a well read uh, man in the classics he had read the customs the manners the actions uh, and writings of the ancients and this made him a shrewd observer of men uh, and of things he was a good critic of drama and if he was present in any performance every actor uh, they would do the best to please him but uh, this uh, bachelor uh, we find that this bachelor visits the theater often uh, and his scholarship enables him to be uh, to be a keen judge of dramatic performance the author then has discussed about sir andrew freeport who was then, a good businessman of london he was very laborious he was very experienced and at the same time he had a great understanding his knowledge of commerce was extensive so sir andrew freeport was a successful merchant uh, he was a merchant of great importance in london he is a man of industry uh, of strong reason of great experience he has his own noble and generous ideas of trade he thinks that it is uh, a stupid way to extend dominion by arms he considers that the real strength of a nation consists in its arts and industry he approves diligence and labor richard steel uh, in the spectator club writes within quotes this is about uh, andrew freeport within quotes he is acquainted with commerce in all its parts and will tell you that it is a stupid and barbarous way to extend dominion by arms for true power is to be got by arts and industry he will often argue that if this part of our trade were well cultivated we should gain from one nation and if another from another i have heard him prove that diligence makes more lasting acquisitions than valor and that sloth has ruined more nations than the sword quotation close so he approves diligence and labor and uh, he knows that the real strength of a nation uh, is in its arts and industry he also uh, has uh, the knowledge of uh, a few maxims like a penny saved is a penny got and uh, sloth is a great destroyer than the sword so he has a natural unaffected eloquence it makes his discourse very pleasing uh for example uh, in the text we find uh, richer still has written within quotes he abounds in several frugal maxims amongst which the greatest favorite is a penny saved is a penny got a general trader of good sense is pleasanter company than a general scholar and sir andrew having a natural unaffected eloquence the perspicuity of his discourse gives the same pleasure that wheat would in another man so uh, his discourse uh, becomes very pleasing because of his natural unaffected eloquence and uh, at the same time he has become rich by plain labor and honest methods he thinks that england may become richer than 
uh, other nations by the same methods he has a business contacts throughout the world he has his own ideals and uh, these ideals are the ways of enlarging a country's trade he was of the opinion that a dominion may be extended by art and industry than by power diligence or industry alone would help the country to gain things of permanent value and sloth or idleness more than the sword has caused the ruin of many nations and at the same time he knew many short maxims uh, he had a unique art of speech so uh, he was a self made person and he believed that england too could become richer than any other kingdoms by methods which had so benefited him after sir andrew freeport uh, we have uh, another man that is captain sentry and the author has described the merits of captain sentry and uh, captain sentry he was very courageous intelligent and had good understanding captain sentry is the next important person so uh, he was a man of great courage good understanding and invincible modesty he possesses great merits but he does not want to show them he was in the army for several years and uh, he served as captain he behaved himself with great gallantry in several engagements he has a small estate of his own being next heir to sir uh, roger uh, he left the army he was such a man who had not received good considerations for his abilities uh, for example uh, in the text uh, richard steel himself writes within quotes i have heard him often lament that in a profession where merit is placed so conspicuous a view impudence should get the better of modesty when he has talked of this purpose i never heard him make a sour expression but frankly confess that he left the world because he was not fit for it a strict honesty and an even regular behavior are in themselves obstacles to him that must press through crowds who endeavor at the same end with himself the favor of a commander quotation close so now we find that uh, captain sentry uh, he had been a captain in military for some years and fought bravely on fronts he left the army uh, because even though he rendered meritorious service which anyone could see and appreciate uh, he uh, did not received any kind of promotion he used to say that only a man could hold a position in military who gets over his false modesty he was of the opinion that it is cowardice to stand back modestly similarly a man who failed to assert himself and demand what was due uh, his due was a coward he was frank in speaking about the weaknesses of his officers this frankness was a part of his character uh we find that uh, richard still writes please look into the text within quote uh, within quote uh, he says uh, it is a civil cowardice to be backward in asserting what you ought to expect as it is a military fear to be slow in attacking when it is your duty with this candor does the gentleman speak of himself and others the same frankness runs through all his conversation the military part of his life has furnished him with many adventures in the relation of which he is very agreeable to the company for he is never overbearing though accustomed to common men in the most in the utmost degree below him nor ever too obsequious from an habit of obeying men highly above him quotation close so captain sentry uh, he was 
uh, a person who was in the military for several years he has commanded many persons in military but he was never haughty he never became a flatterer although he obeyed his superior the next uh, member of the spectator club about whom richard steel speaks about is will hanikom the gallant will hanikom according to his years he should be in the decline of his life let us have a look into the text what richard steel has written about him uh, uh, here we have uh, he has written uh, within quotes we have amongst us the gallant will hanikom a gentleman who according to his years should be in the decline of his life but having ever been very careful of his person and always had a very easy fortune time has made but a very little impression either by wrinkles on his forehead or traces on his brain his person is well turned and of a good height he is very ready at the short of discourse with which men usually entertain women he has all his life dressed very well and remembers habits as others do men he can smile when one speaks to him and laughs easily so this is the description of will hanikum uh, he is a person uh, who has been very careful uh, of his own personality age has not made any impression either on his body or uh, on his mind he is tall he dresses himself very well he is good uh, at conversation uh, so uh, we find uh, he is a very gallant kind of person uh, at the end of the essay the author tells us about one of his companions uh, this companion sheldon uh, waited for him he was a philosopher he was a clergyman uh, this is uh, the pious clergyman the last of the members about whom richard steel is speaking the clergyman is the last member of the club uh, he comes to attend the meetings rarely but he is a very learned person he is a very pious man uh, he is very weak in health he cannot take heavy responsibilities of his profession therefore uh, he is among divines what a chamber counselor is among lawyers the author uh, writes within quotes he is a clergyman a very philosophic man of general learning great sanctity of life and the most exact good breeding he has the misfortune to be of a we very weak constitution and consequently cannot accept of such cares and business as preferments in his function would oblige him to he is therefore among divines what a chamber counselor is among lawyers so uh, he is uh, a very frail kind of person and uh, he cannot take heavy responsibilities and uh, therefore he always chooses lighter kinds of work uh, he speaks any divine topic with authority uh he seems to have no interest in this world so this is his speciality this is uh, a special uh, talent that he had uh, in, uh, he could speak on any topic uh, about uh, divinity uh, with authority and he had great knowledge uh, on that topic so uh, he uh, is he is hastening to the object of his soul's desire and he lived a sacred kind of life thus in the description of the members of the spectator club steel has depicted a cross section of the contemporary society and an interaction between the social classes each of the members has their own individual quality and thus we can regard the spectator club as a miniature version of the society thank you